It's a joy to be here for a lot of good reasons. The uh, time together as a community is valuable. We have so little time as congregationists to get together. We don't have our studies together. We don't have our groups together during the week. You know, this is the only hour that we have, or actually a little less than an hour. I think it's 48 minutes we spend together here. But, uh, you know, it's, so it's good when we get together. And uh, I certainly am thankful for your presence today. That's great. Also thankful for those who are on the YouTube. Uh, we had a delightful report from uh, our brother Jerry about one of our members, uh, one of our viewers that uh, has been watching for some time. And uh, that was a bit of a surprise. Of course, you never know who's watching on YouTube. And in this case, it was a real delight. Uh, so wonderful to have people with us. And any way we can get them to share the good news of the gospel. There's a little bit of Jesus humor there that some of you may have seen. I have friends of mine in this church, there's three of you, who regularly will find humor, <laughs> and you know how pathetic I am when it comes to telling a joke, so you save me the problem by sending me stuff, and uh, this is one of them I thought was kind of good to have. Catch up with Jesus. Let us please and let us praise and relish him. That's so good. Because he loves me from my head to my tomatoes. Or to toes, I think it's what's put the emphasis on there. So that's good. The theme that we're talking about for the last three weeks is a very familiar one to anybody who has studied the scriptures in your Bible studies or on your own whenever the whole theme that Jesus is the bread of life, the living bread. In, this, in the, liter, uh, the uh, lectionary process that we have that I tend to follow because of the gospel, uh, three weeks seems like a whole long time to spend on one subject, which is really about 51 verses. Uh, <laughs> it's astonishing, really, uh, to plumb the depths of it as any preacher or pastor has had the privilege of studying those, you could spend a good hour and a half, two hours in your own leisure studying them and learning from them. A little more challenging when you take them, as we do, by segments and try to re refresh ourselves back into the, the short passage that ultimately it is to, to connect the dots if you want to. So that's the theme for today. And it's one that has made a difference in my life. When I discovered Jesus the bread of life, it made a huge difference. And uh, it took a while to find it, to find him. But I am so thankful for it. So that's generally the theme that we'll be discussing today. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come to your power. Hallelujah. Wonderful introduction. The hour is coming, and now is here. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is welcoming such people to worship him. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Dear beloved, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness, his infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in his presence here in this room or together via the YouTube. In his presence to give thanks for the great benefits we have received at his hands, to declare his most worthy praise and to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and for others those things necessary for our life and their life, our salvation and their salvation. Therefore, come with me to the throne of the heavenly grace. Together, almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep, we have followed too much the desires and desires of our hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have not done, done those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. 
O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare those who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent according to your promises declared to people. Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. I believe that confession helps us almost every day if we were to say it. You know, our Heavenly Father pardons all who truly repent and genuinely believe in his holy gospel. And for this reason, we beseech him to grant us true repentance and to grant us his Holy Spirit, that our present deeds may please him, the rest of our lives may be pure and holy, and at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, when you ask, you shall receive. When you ask for forgiveness, he had so the peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's greet each other. <laughs> nice to see all those folks. <laughs> o Lord, open our lips. O God, make speed to save us. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Venite, the invitation to come, is part of the theme of today's message, Come to the Bread of Life. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. His hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hear his voice. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Another reason why I appreciate that particular vanity is it talks about the truth of who God is. He created everything, including you and I. And there's so many deniers out there today. It seems to be a growing group of people that want to find an excuse to say, yeah, but. <laughs> Wonderful to be able to know the truth. Well, I'm going to invite Richard Bendel to join us on, on the walk through Ephesians. This will also be the fourth week, I believe, where we've been discussing Ephesians. morning. Paul states, so stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we all, we all are all parts of the same body, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work, and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he is, has identified you as his own, quarantining you that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Life, live a, a life filled with love, 
following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God. You know, Richard, you have just read one of the most powerful messages, short of the Ten Commandments, that you could have proof that God wants us to understand. We as Christians can make a big difference, but there's things we will do that will separate us from other people who do not walk the way with Jesus. One of them is, stop telling lies. Well, so that's probably some of you were a little offended when you heard that. You say, well, I don't lie. <laughs> well, this scripture is not just written for you that have read the book and understand and follow Jesus. It's meant for all of us who may suddenly get into the word and uh, don't sin by letting anger control you. I have to share with you a personal story. This is one that I've always found amazing. My mom and dad only had a few short years to live together before he died at 43. But the one thing that I noticed was they seldom ever had harsh words, in, at least in front of the kids, right? We, we, we never heard them ever. Now, my dad was a businessman, so I'm sure that he was, had his own challenges at times. And mom was raising five of us at home in a small house, really. And, uh, you know, I'm sure they could easily have been bickering, but I never knew. My sisters never knew. My brother never knew. But the one thing I did hear them, because we talked about it, they did talk about it. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. I heard that from their lips. I, and you believe that too, don't you? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's so easy to get angry and frustrated. And especially when we are looking at the the conditions that we're in right now. These are roots of us in this world where we've ever found people are willing to, to take you on for any position. Oh, you're a Christian, you're nuts, right? And if, with the media that we have exposing ourselves, anybody who's ever read some of the comment sections in any of the, the feedback that you can get on the Facebook or YouTubes and various places, they're vindictive. They're absolutely hateful. So any person who walks with Jesus, you're going to be persecuted to that kind of hate because it's easy to do now. And we need to be reminded, hold your anger. Don't get half cocked and say something back on your keyboard that you would wish you could now pull back and say, I wish I hadn't done it just quite that way. Anyways, challenging, wonderful opportunity as we realize and Richard, would you lead us in the prayer? Let's say the prayer together. Father, we know you are the Lord God Almighty, creator of the universe, the earth, and all that is. Let the heavens rejoice. You speak, and the world and acknowledges your glory in your Son, Jesus. Through your Holy Spirit, you speak into our lives, that we may live in peace and humility before you and others. We pray that you may see the power of your Holy Spirit working in our lives and empower us to imitate you, Jesus. Let us be a beacon of hope in the challenging world that needs to hear the good news of salvation. Amen. Wonderful. Richard, thank you so much. When we have a music team that decides to uh, make a difference in our worship together. It's always wonderful to discover by email what hymns we're going to sing. Because I know it's, some pastors are very gifted with music. They can both sing and play and do a whole lot of things. This pastor can't. <laughs> so it's, you know, God provides, you know? And so it's wonderful when, uh, when I can have this email opened up and my hope is built on nothing less was the theme for this message while it fits in so gorgeously. So thank you, Richard. Uh, Gord and Jerry are going to lead us on this hymn. <clears throat> Trust the sweetest frame, but holy lean 
Thank you for that wonderful rendition of a fabulous message. That's the gospel right there. What do you think? The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus said to those present, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So the Jews grumbled about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph and Mary, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him or her. And I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except, me, except he who is sent from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and yet they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The gospel of Jesus. Of Jesus. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts present be worthy in thy hearing. Amen. We're delving and digging into John's most amazing revelations of Jesus. Jesus, who's clarifying who he is. Who he is really. He's not just the son of Mary and Joseph. Who he really is. It's time for him to reveal himself. If you want to use the term of the day, he's coming out. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is very important to us followers here today. Is he just a miracle man who seems to have the power to take five loaves and two fish 
and turn them into enough food to feed thousands of people on a hill? Is he like Moses, declaring God's gift of manna in the wilderness to the enslaved people fleeing Egypt? No. No, Jesus is much more. John is reporting the coming out, the declaration, the identifying of his true identity. His true nature. They were missing out on the fact that their Messiah had come. In this passage, Jesus is declaring these things are the evidence, these miracles that he's doing are the evidence that he is God, Father's Son, come down from heaven to earth, incarnate, God himself, to God's chosen people, and even the Gentiles of the day. Jesus is signifying that it is he who is capable of sustaining life. He's not just a food dispenser. This is in contrast to the crowd sense that it was a bread from that miracle that sustained them, but they would be hungry again. But Jesus proclaims, don't miss the point of the miracles. I am, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Did you hear that? He's telling them. Do you get it? Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Up, this, up until this point in the chapter, it is a crowd that basically followed them from the feeding of the 5,000 across the lake over to Capernaum. But now we notice if you go down to verse 59, which I did not include in our reading this morning, it's identified that there's a new location change. It is a synagogue in Capernaum and so the crowd that Jesus is now speaking these words to now includes the synagogue leaders, the teachers, and the scribes, and the rabbis. And these are the people that control the Jewish religion in that region. And they are Jesus' primary opponents. They murmured against Jesus, identifying as the bread of life. That's not true. We know this Jesus. He's the son of Joseph and Mary. And we know them. Now, I have to agree with you that it would be a big step if I had known Jesus since he was a little tyke <laughs> and then up here finding he's now proclaiming that I am the bread of life. I, I get it. I, would, would you? Could you agree? I can see that. It's astounding. Who is this guy? But that's the point. Jesus didn't walk up and just say it. He gave evidence. He healed lepers. He fed 5,000 people. He fed 4,000. He did so many miracles. He didn't walk up and just say it. He gave evidence first before he gave the truth of who his identity is. Signs of supernatural natural capabilities exist from Jesus. Miracles are accomplished by him that the religious leaders know could only be caused by God. They know their book. You know, they were rabbis and scribes. You know, they knew the truth. They read their Torah. These miracles could only be done by God. So therefore, who is this guy? I get the question, but Jesus is making it clear. Deuteronomy, they would have known this particular passage. Deuteronomy 18.15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses said, from among you, from you fellow Israelites. And you must listen to him. Look it up when you get a chance at home. Deuteronomy 18.15. That's the scripture they knew. Now, they didn't know who it would be, and they didn't know when, just like we don't know when he's returning. But that's one they would know. And he's trying to help them understand. Read your book. You know the Torah. Then we'll go to another one. 
Isaiah 11, 2 and 3. Again, you guys know that. If I was speaking to, the, if you were the rabbis and the scribes in front of him this day, questioning who his identity is. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch of his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. That's a very familiar, they were expecting the Messiah, right? They knew the root of Jesse, David, Solomon. They were expecting him. They just didn't realize that he was there with them for 30 years. Wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. These are all things part of that message from Isaiah. Then Isaiah 11.10 states this, familiar passage to all of us. Then in that day the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for the people, and his resting place will be glorious. Well, this is the root who died on a cross and then buried and then gloriously rose from the dead invisible to everybody for 40 days. You could touch him, you could talk to him. Pretty amazing response. The resting place he was, was be glorious. All this evidence that their anticipated promised Messiah has finally come to them in their generation. They read the book, they were praying for it to happen, they were expecting God to live up to his, his promise, and he delivered. God came through. And yet. And yet. These religious leaders find this very threatening to embrace. Has there been a simple sense of misunderstanding by these leaders? Because they knew their Torah. Or are they willfully misconstruing the evidence purposely? Purposely being obtuse about the matters of their faith that they themselves teach and they prophetically expose to others. Despite the evidence of their own scriptures and their own understanding of the man in front of them, Jesus is a threat and he remains so today. Mention that you're a Christian in certain circumstances familiar to you, you will already notice Eyes will go up and raised eyebrows, a little shrug, as if, are you really with it? Jesus, you don't believe that stuff, do you? As Christians, we sometimes don't want to accept what is being taught in the evidence that we have now in this very generation of 2020. There are Christians, not secular folk, there are Christians where science and archaeology is proving the scriptures all the time. I receive messages from a program out of Israel almost every day, but regularly during the week. And they are showing breakthrough news of where another discovery, another tunnel, another cave has been found that's found in the book, especially the Jewish Torah, right? Validating that example from the scriptures. It's all there. And yet so many people huh, poo-poo it, especially the secular folk. But it's most challenging for those of us that believe in the book called the Bible. So I think sometimes we're fighting the obvious. We come to church and we hear the creation story and it was alluded to in our previous worship. That creation story. Well, I think some people will try to rationalize the theory of evolution as Christians. If you're with you know, a group of non-Christians or very liberal Christians, and you sort of almost want to apologize for believing in Noah and the ark or believing in evolution of Genesis. And you know what's story so strange about that? rationally trying to justify that you don't believe in the very book you tend to believe in is one thing. 
But when the scientists of the day and the archaeologists of the day they themselves, maybe many of them unbelieving, are finding it preposterous to have faith in evolution. Over and over and over again, another position of Darwin and his company from the 1840s to this day are being poo-pooed by the scientists of the day. If they're true scientists, even if they're not Christian, they have to admit again, wow. Many people still deny the growing DNA evidence that each human being, each of us in this room, each of us that are viewing this program on YouTube, each and every single person, the seven billion of us on this planet, are uniquely designed by God. And DNA over and over and over again proves it. One of the more popular programs on public TV is a program where they talk about the history through DNA of celebrities. Did you know you're associated with this guy and that person and whatever, whatever. It's really interesting, right? Some of us in the room have done what I have done. I'd go ahead, my son gave me a gift probably three or four years ago now, maybe longer even, but gave me a gift to go ahead and have my, my DNA tested. And I have to be honest with you, at first I didn't know if I wanted to or not, and then I thought, gee, wouldn't it be exciting to find out if I was a Jew or had Jewish blood in me? Because that would really turn me on. I mean, you know, I was hoping, right? Well, it turns out I don't. <laughs> but the point is, the science is pretty clear that each and every one of us in this room will be never again. You're so totally unique. Never again before and never again after. Your life. The science knows it. So you're designed by a designer. And isn't that astonishing to get affirmed? So Jesus unequivocally identifies himself with this statement. One more time, we've heard it. I am the bread of life. And then he adds this adjective. The living bread who came down from heaven. The living bread. And even though their own scriptures point to the proof that he is God, the creator of the universe and all that is, it seems to make little impact on them. Either they decide to ignore the evidence or don't want to at least get into a meaningful discussion of where that might lead. They claim to know who Jesus is. They know his parents, Mary and Joseph, and we're going to hang on stubbornly. We're not going to accept the evidence, the wisdom that you share. You can't possibly have come down from heaven. And they were saying that. They were grumbling. Remember in that scripture, verse 43? Grumbling against Jesus for saying who he is. And Jesus doesn't, he actually challenges them. He actually says, Stop grumbling among yourselves, which, as you read, if you read a commentary, you'll discover it means stop talking and listen to me. It's a very challenging statement when he says that. Stop grumbling. These words, grumbling, decisively indicate that some of these Jewish leaders have not yet understood anything that Jesus has said, or they choose not to. And then he explains this. Jesus makes this statement. No one is able to come to me. No one is able to come to me unless drawn by my father. Verse 44 of the scriptures we just read today. Drawn has also been described as the word dragged. <laughs> A little more aggressively stated. No one comes to Jesus without the father's pull. No one comes to Jesus without the guiding spirit of God. And my friends, that's what happened to me. I was gently led to the conviction that Jesus was real. Not just a storybook that we celebrate at Christmas, but a real person. So in the next verse, Jesus refers to his own scriptures, Isaiah 30, 54, 13. And I looked this up again. There's several versions of it, but this one really is the one that makes it most clear. Jesus says, all who heard from the Father and learned 
from what they heard will come to me. He's speaking right to that group of learned people, religious leaders, and of course the crowd from the hillside. He's making a powerful statement. All who heard from the Father, how would you hear? From the Torah being read in your synagogues and your communities, right? They heard right? and learned what they heard. And again, if the rabbi is doing his job, the scribes are doing their job, they're going to explain what they just heard. So they heard and learned from what they heard. What's the result of that? You will come to me. He challenges these leaders. Check out your own Torah. Hear the teaching from God, and the learning that teaching will result in discovering that your expected Messiah has come, and you'll be drawn to him. For these Jews, Jesus is indicating the choice of a messianic understanding of their own tradition and God's prophecy. Well, the time has come. Whatever choice Jesus makes, it's clear. It cannot happen by yourself. You won't get to me by yourself. You can only get to me by being invited. It's dependent upon God's will, in other words. The Father's call, and they're accepting the call when they hear it, to follow Jesus. The grumbling was because they were trying to fit Jesus into their tradition, their framework. They weren't really accepting the truth that their Savior had come. Now, my friends, I think I could look comfortably at most of you and say there was a time when you would be much like those people hearing Jesus talk. I am the bread of life, the living bread. And you might have said, oh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> we would have taken it sarcastically, maybe. I understand that. That's my experience. I grew up attending church. Born cradle Anglican. Went to St. John's Church as a baby and was infant baptized. Went to that church every Sunday because my father was head of the Sunday school. <laughs> he was a youth group leader. It was... You know, it was mandatory. You show up, you go. You can complain all you want, but you come. <laughs> well, I understood that. And I did my complaining. But I must admit it was joyous when I came to church. There was people I got to learn and like. And I'd see my fellows from school that were there. And we'd hang out together, even, you know, giggling at each other on a Sunday. But I must really admit, during that time, I never really believed the evidence of a living God. I'm not even sure it was taught in that sense. And you know what bugs me is I probably was taught, especially by the minister of the day, Mr. Lane. He, uh, he was a pretty orthodox guy, so I suspect he did it. I just wasn't hearing. Maybe you were like that at some point. Well, that was a case of never believing there was a living God until November of 19, 18, 18, yeah, 1981. <laughs> Some of you think that 18 was, <laughs> I'm not that old yet. But my point being on that wonderful November, 1981, I stopped holding off and accepted Jesus as my savior. Is that your experience too? Could you put a date at somewhere or other when you kind of walked into the belief that this was real? So as I'm closing, I want to share this. Jesus is, a living, is teaching a metaphor that these people would understand. They need bread to live. It was a staple of their diet. But this metaphor is not about food that perishes, <laughs> except a couple of brands I have, I've had in my house, and if you go away on a trip and come back, it's still as fresh as it was you left, so it makes you wonder what's in that bread. But <laughs> that's another story. But my point being, that they know that food has a purpose, but it does perish. And it also, you can eat bread, and three or four hours later, you want more. 
Jesus is talking about what, right? When he says bread, it's essential. It's necessary. It's important in your life. He's really talking about spiritual bread. And it's going to bring you to everlasting life. A living bread within you that is never exhausted. I am the bread of life, Jesus said. A spiritual bread that will sustain you when you accept it, internalize it. But Jesus is not finished with his point. He makes this in conclusion of verse 51 that you heard me today. The bread I will give for the life of the world, hang on, is my flesh. Now you can imagine what the scriptures are going to be about next week. Because <laughs> that's the last verse of this reading. Right? As we continue the challenge. The bread I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now that would be insulting at the time he said it. But the difference is, you and I have read the book, right? There's not too much doubt in my mind that most of us present or those on YouTube get into a Bible study quite regularly and read, and you know what it says in that book. We know a few pages from now, in John, we will discover that Jesus did indeed give his flesh on the cross. That flesh that was damaged and bruised and pierced. He did. But they don't know that yet, right? According to the scriptures we've just read, they're, hold it guys, you just said you are giving your flesh? Well, it means, hang on, folks. You're going to hear shortly, in a few more months, what I mean literally when I say I'm giving my earthly flesh. And what's it going to do? It's going to redeem God's people from their sins. The promise is that he's giving up his life on the cross and he'll do it willfully. God's provision. God's provision is to make his people worthy to live in his presence forever. Yes, we will die. There's not much doubt in most of us I'm looking at, you're looking at me. We'll all probably pass as our ancestors have. That's true. But the promise of the scriptures is you will live eternally. You will live knowing you're saved because of what Jesus did on the cross and because of his redemption, his redemption res resurrection. So that's your destiny. And Jesus will make it happen, my friends. It's good news. So who in our own families, our friends, and congregation needs to let pride, secular culture, and false teaching go? Let it go away. Who do you know? So they can hear and understand and be drawn to Jesus like you have. It's frightening when you think, I couldn't be bold enough to share that with these people. They might say a mean thing to me. <laughs> and they will, very likely. But that's the point. If these are people you love and care for, take that bold step again and again and again, <laughs> knowing that at some point God's invitation will be heard. It's God who draws your loved ones to him. But he wants you to share the good news. Do not give up. This is our eternal hope. Jesus saves and is reaching out to you today and to share the good news that you have a Savior. His name is Jesus, the living bread. Amen. Father God, I am the bread of life is a challenge. We ask that you will help each of us share the good news. Amen. I did build in a little bit of a humor there. Can you see that from the distance? Here's Jesus feeding the 5,000. <laughs> and there's some truth to that, don't you think? I can't eat that, I'm a vegan. 
Has that fish been tested for mercury? Is that bread gluten free? Ha! <laughs> ha! <laughs> you know that one, right? Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if it, how we would have responded. Yeah. Well, one way we can respond in this room together and those on YouTube, we could stand together and share the truth, the Apostles' Creed, joining with people all around this country and around the world. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I just make a passing comment for those who might be wondering why that word Catholic is in there. It's not capital C, it's Catholic as in universal. That's what it means. I believe in the universal church, the forgiveness of sins. And we come to this wonderful prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. To thank the people who have chosen to support this church, even though they're maybe not able yet to come present and be present, uh, I'm so thankful that uh, there is a medium to do it. In our, if you get to our website, many of you have chosen to use the donate button, and uh, I'm very, very thankful for that. As I announced last week, uh, over $729, I think it was, was donated not only to the Anglican Church of Canada, or Na Anglican Network in Canada, uh, to support the National Church, but it was also the same amount was given to the local Lanark County Interval House. That's your money going into action. 10% of all our givings are given to charity. So that's a substantial amount, and we really thank you for doing that. Lord, we give you thanks that we have people who are faithful and givers and keeping this church, contributing to the community, making it possible that we can be able to reach out to all who are present. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Prayers of the people. O oh Lord, show us your mercy. O oh Lord, save our nations. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. O oh Lord, save your people. Give peace in our time, O oh Lord. Let not the needy, O oh Lord, be forgotten. Create in us clean hearts, O oh God. Almighty God, giver of every good gift, look graciously on your church and so to guide the minds of those who have shall choose a bishop for this diocese that we may pre receive a faithful pastor who will preach the gospel. Care for your people, equip us for ministry, and lead us forth in the fulfillment of the Great Commission through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Collect for this season. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of heaven and earth, we give you thanks and praise you through Jesus our Lord. In the fulfillment of your promise, you put forth in your Holy Spirit upon us, filling us with gifts and leading us into all truth. You give us power to proclaim your gospel to all nations and the power to serve you. Therefore, we join our voices with angels in our dwells to proclaim the glory of your name, Jesus. All men, together for the colic for peace. O oh God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us, your humble servants, and all assaults of our enemies, that we may truly trusting in your defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And the colic for grace. O oh Lord, 
our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God. You have brought us to the safety of this day. Defend us by your power, that we may not fall into sin nor run into any danger, and that guided by your spirit, we may be as righteous in your sight, through Jesus Christ. Father, I lift all those who are traveling during this season. Keep them safe when whatever means they are traveling. Put an angel on their bumpers and bring them back. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, the announcements. There's a growing group. <laughs> I'm thankful for that. It's excellent. Uh, yes, we do have protocols and we stick to them. We do ask you to wear a mask. We ask you to do social distancing appropriately, and you do. There's still room, though, however. This pretty big church. <laughs> and so there's room for you to come and join us. I pray that you will. Next week, we'll have a Holy Communion service, but we're being blessed by Alan Mills, who will be leading that service. Thank you, Alan. Appreciate that, bro. The 22nd will be a morning prayer service. It's to yet be determined as to whom and what we're going to do on that, but uh, we'll make sure that happens. Coffee time, a fellowship time. You know, I have to have said it to you before, but I really miss you. And I hope that's true to you, that you guys miss each other too, just connecting. And so today, Caroline stepped up to the plate and arranged for us to have a coffee hour. However, there is a little however. She just told me, we forgot to get fresh milk. So I hope you like your coffee black, but please come. <laughs> Anyways, a short coffee together would be a blessing for all of us. And next week, hopefully we'll get some green. And it is time to come back to church. If you've been brewing it over, considering whether you will or you won't, why don't you come? You know? We have got to the Bible study Zoom meetings. We'll resume in a month. And uh, that's kind of fun because that's a great session for all of us who are participating in it. And there's room for more. 11 o'clock in the morning to 11.40, am I right? 40 minutes, yeah. So a good, a good time to be together. Is there any other announcements? Oh, yes, following up, following up on the request for uh, prayers for Jamie. Uh, there's $28,000 has been raised for Jamie's health fund. That 15-year-old boy uh, who's now got Hodgkin, you guys know this better than I, Hodgkin's disease, but it's, Richard, what's the name of the one I, that he's got? Lymphoma. Lymphoma, yeah. It's pretty serious for a kid, and may, may be brutal. So uh, uh, he needs help. His parents w would probably benefit in a way from having you know a vehicle available to drive. He has a car, but you know hours are hard for, for any of us to, to be able. So there's needs to to be met. And the other thing I want to share with you is a great response. A week ago, I mentioned to you, David is a pastor. It is not. <laughs> there's. <laughs> <laughs> when we have when we have our clericuses, there are five Davids in that group, of which I am one. So we will often invite them to say, come and join the Davids group to the other pastors in the community. Well, this David is one of them, but he's a, he's a chap who's suffering ill health. He's been a pastor in the old church. He left the old church for, for reasons that we're all familiar with. And he went to a smaller church and he has never earned a lot of money to be able to put it aside. He earned a, 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 a life-sustaining sust income, but that's it. And now that he's retired, his pension, of course, that you'd think he'd have, well, he doesn't have one. I don't have a pension either. It's an Anglican priest. I don't have one. It's pretty sad. Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not complaining. Please forgive me. I don't mean it that way, but it is sad for, for this David. There's other Davids in the group that you're all familiar with. You could mention by name. They're not suffering either. In their retirement, they have much money. To, this particular David is not. His wife, Yvonne, is one who needs support as well. They're both not very healthy, and they're challenged. And so if you do want to do anything, here's a way to do it. You can send me an email, and I will give you the email address of the person to do an e-transfer, an e-transfer. 
that will go to, well, uh, Pat Colomb is who it is, uh, you, uh, Reverend Pat Colomb, so you probably all know her. She's the one in charge of our, of our whole region trying to help out David. And so if you know her email, just send a knee transfer there. If you don't, I'll send it to you. Just contact me and I'll forward it. But, uh, and I'm thankful to tell you there's someone who I personally do not know on the YouTube community who has already donated to that particular need. <laughs> wow, I was really blessed, so I, I am thankful for that person's gift. Let us bless the Lord. And would you stand and share the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen. Well, that leads us to our last closing hymn. And what else would be appropriate for the theme of I'm the bread of life, the living God? Here I am, Lord. Gordon. I the Lord and sea and sky I have heard my people cry him calling you I pray so that we can go in peace to love and serve the Lord thanks be to God hallelujah, hallelujah.
<laughs> Good to be with you, folks. Hope to see you next week. God bless.